Dorothy Vogel and Megumi Sasaki join me in Studio Q. Hello to both of you. Hi. Hello. What a pleasure to have you back here. And Thank hello you. to you, Dorothy. Thank you. It's a joy to have you here. I know this is your first time in Toronto. Welcome. Yes, it is. Thank you. I, I, I was very sorry to hear of the, of the passing of your, your, your husband, uh, Herb, last summer. But I'm glad to have you here today. Uh, for those who are not familiar with your story, how did a regular working couple like you and Herb end up building such a remarkable collection? <laughs> it sounds like a fairy tale, doesn't it, it, it? It really does. I just by love and hard work and just do what you love, and it happens. We didn't plan it that way. That's what happened. So, so starting in the '60s, yeah. you end up collecting over four thousand works of minimalist and conceptual art, right? Not just that. We've collected a, quite a variety of different types of work, but those are the ones that people seem to remember. And. Abstract, minimal, conceptual art was so new when you first started collecting. What was it about that kind of art that drew you in? I think all art drew me in. Uh, my husband wanted to be a painter himself, and he was studying at NYU, and I wanted to learn about what he was interested in, so I took courses in painting and drawing, too. And he knew a lot of these artists, so I got to know the artists themselves, and so it was easier to understand the works through their eyes, through them. And that was what was being done at that time. Uh, I was sort of at the end of the abstract expressionist, and those works were too expensive to buy. Pop art had started, and that became expensive very quickly. So when the uh, minimal artists start showing their work, actually just before they really were showing, because they were in the studios, not much in galleries, we knew the artists who were doing it, and that's how that happened. And then we got to know the conceptual artists and went up in there. Well, and this, I mean, you, you're talking about pieces by Richard, Richard Tuttle, uh, Robert Mangold, Christo. This stuff would go on to be worth millions of dollars, but you never sold any of this. You no, never wanted to. No, and we never to. thought that would become worth those millions either. We bought the work because we liked them. And uh, we enjoyed collecting. And uh, fortunately, we did not need the money to sell it. I mean, it sounds very nice. We never sold, and we never did because we never had to. But if we needed money for open-heart surgery or something like that, I would have sold something. But we never had to, and we had good-paying jobs with pensions, so that's well, what happened. Well, you, 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 w- tell me about what kept you passionate about collecting art through the years. Because you're always Bringing meeting new you, people. You're always getting new insights. It's just uh, uh, we learn about one artist and you meet another. It just was a very exciting world at that time. You had a one-bedroom apartment. You still yeah, do. Still do. Uh, and it, it, we see, we've see we seen this in two films now. It's a very full. Uh, Not at, anymore. At, at, its, at, it, yeah, at its peak, you had just art everywhere yes, in this. Yes, that's true. Uh, but you you never stopped collecting. This became something that... Uh, uh, when he died, I stopped. But through the years with, with, with Herb. It no, was, no. But towards the end of his life, he was not able to walk. And uh, he was not in good health, so we stopped going to galleries and museums uh, a few years before he died. So it's, it dwindled down, and now that he's died, uh, I'm not interested in collecting. I don't want to water it down. It's something we did together, and since he can't do it, I don't do it either. Yeah. Megumi, uh, yeah. take us back and, and, and remind us of how this all started for you. Her, Herb and Dorothy are, are I mean, they're, they're certainly legends in the art world. When did you first encounter them and, and then decide to start documenting this journey of theirs? Right. I was working for Japanese Public Television and HK back in 2002. We were assigned to work on our educational program featuring artists, Christo and John Claude, and we were in National Gallery uh, shooting their exhibitions, and all the works of the artists um, were part of Herb and Dorothy's uh, collection, and somebody told me who they were, and I was just totally, totally moved by the story. And one day, I hoped that I would somehow introduce them one way or another. I didn't know it was going to be a feature-length documentary film at that time, but that's what I uh, wanted to. I just wanted to tell the story. What were your first impressions of them? Uh, when I saw them in yeah. person? Well, that was, again, a really fancy party at the Gracie Mansion in New York City. And um, they were there, just so charming and um, so, um, I should say, ordinary compared to the other crowd. They're in, like, designer's clothes and 
uh, Champagne and Herb and Dorothy were there, just like ordinary, ordinary folks. And um, but everybody was drawn to them. They were like the center of the universe. Mm. So that was pretty amazing. So you make that first documentary to great mm -hmm. acclaim in 2009. Tell me about w what precipitated this follow-up documentary, 50 by 50. Yes, um, I never imagined that I would make a follow-up to the story when I finished Her and Dorothy. But right before um, I finished the production of the first film, uh, there was an announcement about this uh, gift project, Her Dorothy and Herbert Bogle collection, 50 works uh, of by 50 states. And um, I said, okay, that's an, that sounds like an amazing gift project. And I really wish that somebody is going to document it. But by that time, I was just totally burnt out. And then six months later, uh, all the recipient museum is supposed to have exhibition within five years of their receipt of the uh, works. And the first museum was Indianapolis yeah. Museum. And I was just so, um, I went to um Let me ask you about that show. in a second, actually. Okay. Let me just bring Dorothy in here for a second. By 2008, Dorothy, your collection consisted of over 4,000 works. Where did the idea of this national gift program, 50 Works for 50 States, come from? It came from Ruth Fine, who was the curator of, uh, at that time, of modern prints and drawings. And she knew that uh, we had a lot of work that was... Uh, uh, has to be distributed somehow, and the, it was too much for the National Gallery to absorb. They already absorbed quite a bit of it anyhow. And then she happened to be in Texas, and I think in El Paso, and she saw the Crest Collection, which was a collection of old master paintings, and they were in different uh, museums throughout the United States where there was a Crest store, and they had little collections of Crest works in each of these uh, museums, and the core of that was at the National Gallery. So she's had the idea, why not have the Vogue collection like the Crest collection? And when she first told us about her idea, we thought it couldn't be done. I said, do we have enough work to do that? And she said, sure we did. And sure enough, she did it. Now, I just want to add that the influence came from the Crest collection, but because we have a website that is eventually we'll have all the photographs of all the works in the project. We'll be uh, completing the holdings. The Crest Collection is now doing the same thing. We were influenced by the Crest Collection. Now we're influencing the Crest <laughs> Collection to have a website of listing all the holdings in their collection. But part so of this is, it, it, it's true that in 1992, you decided to transfer your collection to the National Gallery of Art. You no, know, it sounds a little misleading. They took the works to Washington, but that didn't mean they were going to own them. We gave them a big portion, but we knew eventually we'd have to find a home for the rest of it. And we weren't sure what to do, but it was this brilliant idea. They couldn't idea. display all your pieces. They Ruth. don't now. They do on occasion take things out. But uh, Ruth said that in this project, this idea, everything has to be shown within the first five years. So then the whole collection of that project will be shown. Did, did you ever worry about physically splitting up the collection? Well, some uh, people were against the idea because they felt it was splitting the collection. But if we didn't do it, it would, would have been split up because we couldn't have find one place that would take all of it. It's just too much. But with this website, it's keeping it all together. There was a catalog for the project, but the website brings it together. So it's conceptually, it's still our collection. We did not break it up. It's still our collection. How did it feel when, when parts of the collection were finally picked up and taken out of your apartment? Uh, I think I felt liberated. <laughs> <laughs> I felt great. <laughs> the, we're, we're doing the best thing for the collection. I had some space. Not sad, not melancholy. See your no. babies leaving. The, no, the... I felt good. And then we filled it up again. So it wasn't <laughs> right. empty for very long. Right. It's now more empty now. But I still have not artwork to get rid of, but I still have stuff. After living uh, and being married for over 50 years, you accumulate things. So now I'm in the process of getting rid of other things as well to clear the apartment. I, I don't mean to press the point on this, but it's just such a, a beautiful and fascinating part of this story that because visual art, a, a famous visual art, it has become such a big business, for these two people living relatively modestly in a one-bedroom apartment to not sell any of it, to not go into that business. Fortunately, to, we didn't need to. 
but again, that's a beautiful thing to say, given that so many people would have capitalized on it anyway and made millions of dollars. <laughs> Tell me about the conversation. You Did you guys ever even have that conversation about selling? Never, never. No, I... Uh, no, we, 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 that, that's not why we collected. It's pretty. It's it's yeah. It's pretty amazing. Isn't it's it? pretty amazing. That's why I was just so moved by that story. I think there are many stories by um, you know just ordinary people, middle class people, uh, created amazing, great collections. But I don't think not too many people have ever come with the decision not to sell anything. So uh, that's like a unique part of that. But keep in mind that my husband had a great eye. My husband was brilliant, and uh, it was his eye that did it. Mm. I helped him. I encouraged him, and we worked together, but uh, he, had, he was a unique person. And I don't think an ordinary person would have done it, but my husband was not ordinary. Right. In that sense, he was just so talented and... He had amazing eyes. Well, me, you were going to tell us about the first museum uh, to show its mini Vogel collection, and it was in right. Indianapolis. Why, why was that important, and that the Vogels are be seen in a smaller uh, city like that one? I think, um, well, Indianapolis was the first museum to show the exhibition that happened in 2008, December 2008, and Herb and Dorothy happened to be there. So I thought, well, I, why don't I just follow them and film it? Um, and then I realized that this was my very first time to see their collection in the museum setting. It's um, in, the, in the works of like as many as 50 works together. Mm. So that represented like many Vogel collection. And then I was just so um, really, again, impressed by how great eyes that they had. And I felt like, well, I, it's almost like, you know, you're following a very famous actor in four years and backstage and never seen their real act on the stage with a spotlight. That was like, that's the way I felt it. So I felt like I didn't know much at all about their collection and what kind of art that they collected. So it really inspired me and wanted to go more deeper, go deeper to explore about their collection. Dorothy, I know you've been traveling to many of these 50 by 50 gallery openings. What is it like to see the work in a whole new, more public context? I feel very good about seeing it. But it, it, you sounded like I go to all of them uh, because my husband couldn't travel. We could only go to those that you can go by automobile. And we did go to Indianapolis, but that was the last time he was on a plane. And actually, it was the last time I was on a plane, too, <laughs> come to think of it. But uh, uh, fortunately, we hear about them, but we haven't been able to get to many of them. We did go to the one in Montclair, New Jersey, and we went to the one at the Albright Knox in New York. And we went to Delaware. We were in um, Maryland and in uh, Pennsylvania. That's about it. Next week, I'm going to go into the one in Los Angeles with my sister-in-law, Herbie's sister, so I'll see the one in the L.A. Mocha next week. Megumi, Herb and Dorothy are such atypical figures in the art world, one that often seems predicated on money and competitiveness. Mm -hmm. What what kind of lasting impact would, would you say they've had in the American art scene? I think um, Herb and Dorothy inspired in so many levels that art is not accessible only to those who have lots of money or higher education about the art history. And um, also, you don't, need, um, you, you don't need to explain art with a very difficult language. You can just like art or dislike the art. Uh, how simple is that? So um, there's so many messages, and um, more than anything, the passion. It's not just about art, but how... Uh, passion can fulfill your life. It's not about money to be happy or have a wonderful life. Dorothy, Herb passed away last July, um, just before his 90th birthday. How are you doing these days? I'm coping. Mm. In, the, in the film, you say that you saw a white butterfly at the funeral. Yes. I feel he's right with us here, right now. It's a beautiful film. It's a beautiful uh, life project that, that uh, you and Herb have had. And I thank you so much for being here today oh, to share thank it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to be so emotional, but I'm not used to being without him.
I don't think anybody listening would be surprised that uh, you're emotional. And, and I thank you for joining, for, for bringing that with you today. Um, Dorothy, thank you for this. Megumi, thank you. Thank you, Gian. <laughs>